the menopause and beyond brings with it tiredness. The experts tell us that our bones and muscles will wither away, leaving us frail and fragile. And then of course, there's the brain fog. Oh, the brain fog. So what if all this could be fixed by a single supplement? Sounds enticing, doesn't it? There's been a lot of internet buzz around creatine. It's traditionally been associated with the bodybuilding community, but could it work for postmenopausal women as well as the gym bros? A powerful tool to slow aging or a load of old hype? In this video, I will run through the science so you don't have to, and I'll let you know if I've decided to give it a go or not. And if we've not met, hi, I'm Ruth, retired NHS doctor turned registered health coach. I like unpicking the science for over 50s women to boost energy and confidence through lasting healthy habits. And if you're returning, thanks for sticking around. Let's be honest, after 50, it can feel a little bit like your body's gone off road and is heading for the hills and there ain't enough gas in the tank. Low energy is common and exercise can feel a lot more difficult. One of the biggest challenges our body faces is loss of muscle. So this starts in our 30s and left unchallenged, it can lead to something called sarcopenia. So that's muscle loss so pronounced, it leads to poor strength and poor mobility. So basically the stereotype of the frail old lady. Muscle loss can also have a significant effect on our metabolism. So back to the car analogy. So if you've got a bigger engine, you're going to burn more fuel, even if the car is idling. Smaller engine means i.e. your muscles are not burning enough fuel, so not using as much energy. So muscle loss shrinks your metabolism and it also impacts your body's ability to use glucose and take it from the blood, so-called insulin sensitivity. So then if you add in bone loss, which leaves us vulnerable to fractures and a bit of brain fog where it feels like someone you know, turned down the dimmer switch on your brain, it can feel a bit like the start of a slow decline. But lovely ladies, we do have the tools to fight back. And one of the biggest ones is using those muscles. Now it's perfectly possible to maintain and even build muscle in your 50s, your 60s, even your 70s. But I'm not gonna lie, it does take work. Specifically resistance exercise, you've gotta use those muscles. It's pretty much non-negotiable. And of course, yes, we need to make sure we're eating enough protein, but basically you could stand in your kitchen all day chugging back the protein shakes and it ain't gonna make much difference if you're not using the muscles. So they need to be worked either with barbells or dumbbells or resistance band or body weight exercises. If it's challenging you, it's doing the job. But what if we could maximize those sweet, sweet gains with a Z? Enter creatine. It's been, as I've said, traditionally associated with the bodybuilders, but it's not a steroid or a manufactured performance enhancer. It's a version of a substance that our bodies already make. Now, I recently posted a poll on my community page asking my subscribers if they were taking creatine or not. And at the time of filming, these are the results. 25% said yes, 12% said no, I choose not to, 31% said they were thinking about it, and 32% ticked what's creatine. And to answer that question, we need a little bit of biology. Now that was my favorite subject at school, so here goes. Creatine is made from three amino acids and amino acids, well, they're the building blocks of protein. Now, creatine is stored in the body, mainly in the muscles, in the form of phosphocreatine, which contains phosphate groups. And these are important in the production of energy. Cells make energy in the form of ATP in the mitochondria. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So tri meaning three, so it has three phosphate groups. Think of these as tiny little batteries powering our cells. When ATP is used to drive chemical reactions, it gives up one of its three phosphate groups and turns into adenosine diphosphate or ADP. Now to recharge the battery, it needs a phosphate group adding again to take it back to ATP. And that's where creatine comes in. It's a phosphate donor and it allows those little batteries in our muscles to recharge quicker and give away their energy faster. Now we do make our own creatine in the liver, kidneys and brain, but we also get it from food, but predominantly meat and fish. So vegetarians and vegans, well, they tend to eat less creatine. 
Creatine supplements are mainly found in the form of creatine monohydrate, which you can buy either in tablets or capsules or as a powder. The usual dose recommended by the experts is three to five grams a day. The collective wisdom used to be that you needed a loading dose, so a higher dose for a short period of time to get the body's stores up. But now that's mostly thought to be unnecessary. So should I be taking creatine? Should you be taking creatine? Let's cut through the hype and look at the actual science. First the benefits, then the risks, and then my conclusion as to what's right for me because health is personal. The first thing to say is there's a lot of research been done on creatine. There's over 500 published studies on PubMed. So this is one of the most well-researched supplements out there. So firstly, the benefits are muscle growth. And this is why creatine has been so popular in the bodybuilding community for so long. So remember I said that creatine helps to charge the little batteries in your muscles. Well, obviously when you go to the gym, you're using an awful lot of energy with those muscles. So a little bit of creatine is helping you meet that demand. So this means you can work a little bit harder and push out a few more repetitions or reps of the exercise. And an extra one or two repetitions might not sound like a lot, but each time you go to the gym, that's going to accumulate like compound interest. And the research shows that combining creatine with resistance exercise increases muscle size and strength more than just doing the exercise on its own. So if we're looking at improvements in measurable outcomes like a leg press or a chest press, well, these are the movements that translate to real life. So the stuff that keeps us mobile as we age. So let's briefly look at the details. Firstly, this large meta-analysis, remember that's a study that combines the results of lots of other studies. Well, they looked at 143 studies, and this is recent, it was done in 2024. And it showed that creatine did affect body composition to a degree in that it reduced fat mass and it increased fat-free mass. And a quick note on semantics, fat-free mass and lean mass, they're very similar, they're not quite the same, but they both provide an estimation of muscle mass. But the other thing to say is they include a lot more things other than just muscle, because it's pretty much everything that isn't fat. Now, this obviously included a lot of studies and some of them were in older adults, although most were in the under 40s. They did do a subgroup analysis of the over 40s though, and those findings did persist. So creatinine did help. And these two studies, well, they showed an improvement in muscle strength from creatine alone in older women. But the thing to say is they were both very short. They were both done over seven days, so they don't really translate well to real life. However, this study was done over two years and they gave women three grams of creatine a day and they didn't do any resistance exercise and it made absolutely no difference to either their bone health or their muscle mass. However, combine the creatinine with resistance resistance exercise and the effects are greater. In this study, postmenopausal women were given five grams of creatinine daily for three months and they did do resistance exercise. And at the end of the three months, there was a measurable and significant increase in muscle mass as well as upper and lower body strength compared to the placebo group, i.e. the women who weren't taking any creatine. And this is the crucial take home. So much like protein, creatine isn't a magic pill. It's not going to do the work for you. You still got to show up and challenge your muscles but it does ensure that all the effort you put in is going to give you the best possible results and this isn't about bulking up so you look like Arnie in the 80s it's about hanging on to that functional strength that gives us quality of life as we age and if you're enjoying my approach in this video why not sign up to the wise women's well-being newsletter I share deeper insights once a week around health for over 50s women, and I always follow the evidence. I'll put the link in the description or on the screen. Next, bone health. So our bones are like the body's scaffolding. And when we go through the menopause and estrogen declines, well, this scaffold can start to become fragile and more prone to fracture. Estrogen is a key player in regulating bone turnover. So when it declines in menopause, bone breakdown can outpace bone formation. And this eventually leads to a loss of bone mineral density and osteoporosis. 
Now I'm sure we all know about calcium and vitamin D, but resistance exercise is also really important for maintaining bone density. Because when we use those muscles, they pull on the bone via the tendons and that stress helps to promote bone formation. So the thought is that because creatine helps with the muscles, it can also help with the bones by increasing that pull. Remember that study I showed you earlier where women took creatine for two years with no change in bone density? Well, this study, they took it and combined it with resistance exercise and it did show an improvement in bone density. So again, it suggests it's that combination of creatine and exercise that's going to make the difference. Although there's not as many studies on bone density. Now the brain is the powerhouse of the body and that uses energy. So about 20% of the body's total goes to firing up those little gray cells. So as well as powering the muscles, ATP, well that also powers the neurons in your brain. So the theory says that creatine should therefore support brain function. And there is a little bit of evidence for this. This meta-analysis showed that taking creatine improved memory in adults, and that was most pronounced in older adults, so from 66 to 76. But there's less evidence for other aspects of brain function, things like processing speed, attention, or overall cognitive function. So I think it's fair to say that when it comes to brain health, some more research is needed, but the work on memory looks promising. So moving on to the risks. Now, it's fair to say that supplements are not subject to the same regulatory mechanisms as prescription medications. So make sure you're buying your creatine at a reliable and reputable source. Now, one of the biggest concerns around creatine is hair loss. And we know that in the menopause and postmenopause, we're prone to hair loss anyway. So the thought of losing yet more of those precious, bleh, precious strands is obviously concerning. Now the concern around creatine and hair loss concerns something called DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone. Now some of the testosterone in our bodies, and yes, women, we make it too, well that breaks down to DHT, and DHT acts on the hair follicles. It makes the follicles smaller, so their hair becomes finer and weaker and falls out more. And this leads to male pattern and female pattern hair loss or balding. And in women, this is most common at the crown and around the parting. In men, again, the crown and at the front of the hair here. Now, the concern around hair loss, well, that stems from one study where they took a relatively small number of healthy rugby players and they got a loading dose of creatine for seven days and then five grams a day for 14 days. And compared to the control group, their DHT levels increased significantly. And that's where the concern comes from because obviously then there is the theoretical risk of hair loss. But during this study, they didn't actually look at hair loss itself. And those results have never been replicated in any other studies. Now this year, in April 2025, a group, well, they set out to answer the question of does creatine cause hair loss once and for all. Now they used a slightly different protocol in that they didn't use a loading dose. They just gave five grams a day, but they did do it for 12 weeks. So they took 45 men who did resistance exercise and split them into two groups, half of whom got the creatinine and half of whom got a placebo. And this was a double blind trial, i.e. neither the investigators or the participants knew who was getting what. So it was reducing bias. And they found no significant difference between the groups in terms of measured DHT and testosterone. And they also did assess hair loss. And again, they found no difference between the two groups. Now, the slight caveat is, yes, it was a small study and it was also looking at young, so under 40, 18 to 40 year old men, not at older women, but it is kind of the only study we've got. And however, anecdotally, I do know that there are men and women out there who both feel that creatine has given them hair loss. The other concern is damage to the kidneys. Now this means a little bit more biology. Bear with me, we're nearly done. Now creatine is converted in the body to creatinine. Creatinine is excreted through the kidneys. So we measure it and we can use it as an estimation of kidney function. And this led to the concern that if you increase creatine and creatinine in the blood, you can potentially damage by overloading the kidneys. And there have been a number of studies looking at it and they were summarised quite nicely in this review article from 2021. And they concluded that taking creatine in the recommended dose doesn't cause any kidney damage in healthy individuals. Note healthy individuals. There's not really been any work done on people with pre-existing kidney disease. So if you do have kidney disease, please speak to your doctor before considering creatine supplements. 
And finally, some people think that creatine makes them have weight gain. And this could potentially be due to water because creatine hangs on to water, so it'll increase water in the body. There's no evidence, however, that it increases fat mass. So in conclusion, creatine has been well studied and there's been no major side effects flagged for people with normal kidney function. And it's moved from being a secret weapon for bodybuilders into the mainstream as a tool for healthy aging. It does appear to preserve muscle mass and it might also help with bone strength, making it a way to preserve physical strength and build resilience when combined with appropriate exercise. And it might also help brain function and memory, but we need a bit more evidence for that. Now getting older, well, it's always gonna bring changes, but as science progresses, we do get a few extra tools to help manage it. And creatine, when paired with the non-negotiables of resistance exercise and a healthy diet with adequate protein, well, it seems like a good solution. And given I'm otherwise healthy with normal kidney function, I'm going to give it a go for a couple of months and assess how I feel. I'm going to feed back. And your decision, well, that's also personal too. And if you do have any health concerns, check with your doctor first. And if you want to give strength training a go, but you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, I'll leave a video here on my three steps to start exercising in midlife and I'll see you there.